Hey, what's up guys, it's Matt with Movement System. In this video, we're gonna take you into the gym to help you learn about force plate testing. I just did five different tests on a force plate and I'm gonna explain to you exactly how those tests work and what those numbers mean. Whether you have access to a force plate right now or you might in the future, or you just wanna better understand how the tests work in the data so you can better understand research, we're gonna take you through all five and explain exactly how it works. Let's go ahead and dive into it. Okay, so to start off, I wanna give a big shout out to Coach Ben. Ben works with a lot of pro basketball players, so he invested in force plates to help test his athletes. So he invested in these force plates to measure his athletes' performance and make sure that they're objectively improving from the training that he's doing with them. He was nice enough to offer to do these five tests on me to help me learn from the data and continue to grow as a sports scientist. I really do appreciate that. And I'm excited to share my data with you guys so the way you can learn from it as well. So it's important to properly warm up before testing. And you can see that's what I'm running through now. A series of exercises including light jogs, high knees, butt kicks, karaoke in three different levels, as well as lunges, backwards RDLs with a reach across the body. We're all used as a general warm up for the body. From there, we started to get into more specific jumping warm up, and that was with pogo hops down and back and then moving on to a snap down exercise. This was to start to practice the movement pattern of jumping to get ready for testing. Now, of course you can do any warm up you want, but you want your warm up protocol prior to testing to be the same if you're testing on one day versus another day, so that way the data is repeatable and objective. For me, the warm up ended with eight snap downs on a cue, five snap downs to a vertical jump, and then about five band assisted jumps. This was really to maximally ramp up the nervous system and get ready to go for testing. From there, I had to create a force plate profile on the app. So Ben uses Vald force plates, V-A-L-D. And there are a couple different companies that make force plates, Vald and Hawkins. Ben said he actually rents his force plates from Vald for about $380 per month. There is the option to actually buy a force plate. And although you can't find any prices on the websites without putting your information in, he said that they were about $6,000 for this type of force plate. There are a couple different options, one being cheaper, one being actually more expensive, but he went with the midline option with bald. All right, after the profile was set up, the force plates were in place. We were all ready to test. You just have to step on and get your weight. I weighed in at 203. Then it was time to actually do the first jumps. The first of five force plate tests that I did was a counter movement jump. And this is your typical vertical jump. But in this case, we were not using arm swing. By testing without arm swing, you're really getting objective data about lower body force production and power production, not so much about how efficiently you're moving your arms. Ben said it's just a little bit easier to look at the data this way, and it's more consistent from trial to trial. We'll talk about all the data at the end and what it actually means, but as a little sneak peek, here's what that graph looks like for the counter movement jump, and my counter movement jump was about 12.4 inches high. Now this is a good time to mention that I'm actually coming from this after doing a bunch of endurance training and then recently doing a triathlon race. Triathlon went well, but I actually wanna get back into plyometric training. So I am going to be starting a plyometric training specific program right now, and this is testing day one. I think as a strength and conditioning coach, it's not that important to have the highest vertical jump or bench the most amount of weight or be the best endurance athlete. It's just important that you know how to objectively improve those numbers for your athletes. And you do have to experience that training yourself to some extent to be able to do that well. Hopefully, as long as everything goes well, we'll actually be retesting in about two to three months after this training program to show you guys the actual results from that style of training and what it measurably improved. Make sure you're subscribed for that. Okay, test number two was a static squat jump. And this one, you actually squat down and you hold for five seconds before jumping. This is to specifically test concentric power production. So we don't involve the stretch shortening cycle with this squat jump, whereas with the counter movement jump, we involve the stretch shortening cycle from dipping and then jumping. The way these force plates work is they're very sensitive. So they can tell you exactly how much you're pushing into the ground, exactly when you left the force plate, how much time you were in the air, and when you landed to calculate how high you jumped. It also, through the graphs, tells you about how your weight distribution was from one leg to the other, and how rapidly you accepted forces when you were landing. There's a lot of really cool data. If you compare the counter movement jump to the squat jump, is that the squat jump doesn't have a dip where we're actually unloading and using that stretch shortening cycle. In the case of the squat jump, it's just a bump up. 
You can actually see there's a slight dip on my right side because I kind of shift towards that side whenever I go to produce force. Just something interesting about the way that I produce force, but for the most part, it's just very flat and then you boom, ramp up right to force production. Ben said it's pretty typical to have about a 10% difference between counter movement jump and static squat jump. In my case, I was about 20% difference with 20% higher counter movement jump than a static squat jump. That may be an indication that I can't produce quite as much force without using a counter movement, so I'm needing to practice that a bit more. With a lot of this data, it really comes down to comparing initial testing to your testing weeks or months later to actually see how you've improved and if the training program is working. So think of all the little pieces of information as a piece of the puzzle that you can kind of keep an eye on over time to change your training variables. Test number three was a pogo hop test. This is when you test 10 hops up and down with an arm swing in this case, and you stay on the force plate that whole 10 reps. This is really a test to see if you can be elastic and remain bouncy for 10 repetitions consistently. Some athletes will be really explosive for one rep, but they will kind of drop off their power with 10 reps. In the case of the repeated pogo hop, I had a mean reactive strength index of about 2.27 between reps. This is what my data looked like for that test. This is testing mean reactive strength index or the fast stretch shortening cycle function because it's those quick ground contact times and a bunch of repetitions in a row. I actually don't know if this number 2.27 for this specific test is good or not. I would probably have to see other athletes do it and compare it to other athletes numbers to really get a better feel for this. For now, I'm just gonna save this as a starting point and see if it improves over time. We're at halfway through so far. This is tough, I mean, you gotta, you gotta work for these, you gotta go max height. All right, test number four was the drop jump. And this is where it starts to get interesting because when you have a drop jump number that you can compare to a counter movement jump number and a static squat jump number, you can start to come to different conclusions about training. Ben and I realized after this test that I probably dropped too low and took this as more of a depth jump than a drop jump. And that may have thrown off the data a little bit. A drop jump is generally whenever you're keeping shorter ground contact time and getting explosive off the ground. A depth jump typically involves a little bit more ground contact time where you're really going for max height and it's not quite as elastic. In this case, I should have done the drop jump, but I did do it as more of a depth jump. So the data wasn't very good here. Regardless, let's take a look at the data. I jumped about 15.6 inches with this and this is what the graph looked like. If we compare this back to the counter movement jump, the drop jump or depth jump that I did instead in this case is a bit more sharp in terms of how quickly we have to absorb force. That's because we're carrying momentum down into the ground when we step off that box and fall down rather than just dropping our hips down. It's still a little bit sharper in there and it also takes a little bit longer for that force to stabilize upon landing. That's something that actually can change over time is how quickly you can stabilize after landing. Okay, let's look at the last test so that we can really dig into the data and talk about what reactive strength index and dynamic strength index actually means. Okay, so for test number five, we have isometric force testing. This is the only test that's really strength focused and maximal force production for five seconds. Ben had to actually move the force plates into this metal bracket and then attach a belt. He's using a belt squat for this and this is actually what I've seen PJF Performance recommend as well because it eliminates grip strength as a limiting factor. You may see in the research though a mid thigh pull as an overcoming isometric used instead, but I do think a belt squat probably gives you the best data. We set up here for a knee angle that's similar to a mid thigh pull. You can be the judge of this if you think it might be a little bit too much, a little bit too shallow, but I think consistency is really what matters here between one testing session and another. So with this test, it was a five second maximal isometric and this is what it looks like. It was an all out push into the ground, really driving through that belt, trying to essentially push your feet through the ground as hard as you possibly can. And for me, that was around 4,653 Newtons the first time, 5,182 Newtons the second time. This is where the data starts to get really interesting because now we can actually compare how much force can I generate with a maximal isometric and then how much percent of that can I actually generate during fast ballistic activities. Some really bouncy elastic people can generate similar amounts of force on the force plate with an isometric test versus on a jump. I am not one of those people. In my case, the dynamic strength index was about 0.46. One way to think about this is that I was able to produce about 46% as much force jumping as I was 
isometrically doing a belt squat. So the equation to calculate dynamic strength index is the amount of force that we produce during a counter movement jump divided by the amount of force that we produce during isometric testing. So if we look back at the graph of counter movement jump, that green line got up to right around 2,500 newtons, whereas during the isometric testing, we got to about 5,000 newtons. That's why it was roughly about 0.5 or about half as much force production in the counter movement jump as in the isometric testing. Now this has important training implications because it means that I'm only expressing half of the force that I could express during a jump. This should actually make sense based on the type of triathlon training that I did. I did a bunch of endurance training and I also did some strength training to support that and some extensive plyometrics, just like small pogo hops and things like that, but not a lot of intensive or maximally explosive jumps. I've watched some of PJF Performance's videos on this and he said that if he sees someone less than 0.6 on dynamic strength index, often he's going to put them on very little resistance training, maybe even just once a week, but a lot of plyometric specific training because the strength's already there, you just need to learn to express it more quickly. If someone's around 0.6 to 0.8, they're actually pretty well balanced. That's where you would wanna do concurrent training where you're doing some strength, some plyometrics, but they're not super off one way or the other. If someone is above 0.8 and they're getting to 0.9 or even close to 1.0, that means that they're already reaching really their ceiling of force potential. They need to lift weights to increase their ceiling or increase their potential in order to actually be able to keep getting better and keep jumping higher. If you have access to force plates and you can test this number on yourself, that's obviously the best way to do this. But you can also think that there's general characteristics of athletes, like your springy athletes who aren't very strong, who are gonna be really close to that 0.8 or above more likely. And you have your previous power lifters or your athletes that just haven't done a lot of plyometric training, don't jump a lot, like myself, who are gonna be low and need to prioritize plyometrics. Of course, it's best if you can measure and see that change, but you can also just think about where an athlete might fall based on this premise. Now, in addition to dynamic strength index, you may also have heard of reactive strength index or RSI. The equation for reactive strength index, RSI, is jump height in meters divided by ground contact time. And this is a number that you can get with a little bit less equipment. You don't necessarily need a force plate for it. If you have a timing mat that you can tell how long you're off of the ground for, you can estimate this number. There are some apps that can tell you pretty accurately how high you jumped in meters, and you can divide that by ground contact time if you have a contact mat to come up with reactive strength index. Less than 1.5 for reactive strength index is considered very low. 1.5 to 2.0 is considered a little bit more moderate, and you have to get all the way to 3.0 or above to really be considered a very good reactive strength index. In my case, my reactive strength index number was about 0.96, very low, definitely need some work on plyometrics. Again, I'm not really worried about this. It just comes down to training specificity. I think with doing 60 to 90 days of power and plyometric specific training, we'll be able to see that number increase. All right, hopefully seeing some real numbers, some real graphs, some real numbers in Newtons, some real numbers in inches, helps you understand this data a little bit more to help you interpret research better, as well as potentially guide your own training decisions. Definitely follow Ben to learn more. I'll put his Instagram link in the description below. If you're interested in looking into force plates yourself, you can check out Vald or Hawkins, or if you know of another alternative, feel free to leave it in the comments below. I'm excited to see what you have to say. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and I will catch you in the next one.